This is Berkeley, eight miles east of San Francisco. It has a population of 108,000 people. They produce about 150,000 tons of garbage a year. That's almost a ton and a half per person. Most of this garbage has ended up here, in the landfill on the Berkeley Marina. Millions of tons of assorted materials are buried here, actually filling the bay. Today it is closed. It has officially reached its limits and may be converted into a park. Landfill disposal means that the materials come to the dump all mixed together. Wood, metals, paper, plastics, brush, oil, glass. The cat further compacts these by running over them. Each day's work is covered with a layer of earth. In this way, the garbage is buried. I went to the Berkeley landfill before it closed to see urban ore at work on their salvaging operation there. Urban Ore is a recycling company which was started in 1980 by Bob Beatty, Steve Drabinsky and Dan Knapp. Shelley Hendricks was salvaging there from the outset. Uh, like metal, pieces of metal, pieces of copper, little plates, dishes, glass, clothing, um, anything that we found value in or, um, that shouldn't be wasted we picked up, carried over to uh, some kind of vehicle, a van or a truck, we put it on the truck and then take it over to one central location where we try to organize it, try to clean it and then uh, sell it or scrap it out. Steve Drabinsky was manager here. Ever since we started operating we never have we have never had any uh, support from the city or the state, any financial support. Um, we make about probably half our income from the metals that we recycle and probably the other half from the building materials and household goods. Berkeley Landfill, the end of an error, artist Russ Brown. In August 1983, it was officially closed. But the trash moves on at ever greater costs to the city of Berkeley. It costs $100 a ton to dispose of garbage, $75 to pick it up and $25 to dump it. The city built a transfer station to handle the waste, now that the landfill was closed. It is run by Browning Ferris Industries, or BFI. They charge by the cubic yard to dump here. truck is waiting outside. It will transport or transfer the waste from Berkeley to Richmond some 13 miles away, where it will once again be buried in a landfill. 75,000 tons a year are disposed of in this way. That's about half of Berkeley's total waste stream. Urban ore moved here too when the transfer station was built. 
Aaron Logan salvages amidst the rubbish. Every day is a treasure hunt. You never know what you're going to find. And I'm always finding nice things, tools, furniture, antiques, heirlooms, things that, that connect me with days gone by. In 1976, the city of Berkeley passed a resolution declaring their goal to be one of 50% recycling. The key to recycling is separate. Taken together, the materials are trash. But once you separate them, they become valuable resources. It takes an eye for uh, beautiful things, I think. And it, take, it takes the knowledge of... Um, it takes a little knowledge of, of, of design, what, you know, what's a shower curtain, what, what's needed to hook it up, the hardware, the tools, the lumber, you know, the windows, what, what's a good window. Yeah. And you need to know the metals too. And but more the things that are really worth a lot of money to us are the antiques and you do have to have a good eye for that. You have to know, you know, you have to do a little research. Meanwhile, the trucks leave here ten or fifteen times a day each one filled with mixed up material. Shelley Hendricks and Steve Drabinsky run the new urban ore site on 2nd and Gilman streets, just beside the transfer station. Customers can drop off their recyclables here for no charge on their way to the transfer station. They may also browse around the flea market. We do, we do it much more economically. We, do, we dispose of garbage probably at a maximum of $15 a ton, whereas they're disposing of it for something like $80 or $90 a ton. Urban Ore applies manual work to the materials to make them fit for resale. This idea is reflected in their logo, designed by Mark Gorel, showing three nail pullers within the circle of recycling. Urban Ore's second outlet is on 6th and Gilman streets and specializes in building materials. It is run by Dan Knapp. Some of the old appliances and fixtures and things are real nice, too, like the older toilets. Some of them are very pretty, you know, if you like toilets. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> baths. Or bathtubs, yeah, bathtubs are very interesting. There's a lot of interest in clawfoot tubs and stuff like that. A window sash, a double-hung window sash that we save from the landfill we might sell for seven fifty, and to buy one fabricated, which is your other real option since they don't really carry uh, replacement windows as a building materials item, uh, then it, it'll run you about 40 to $50 for the same sash. So we have them that range from, I mean, maybe uh, 250 for one that's pretty rotten to uh, one that's maybe 1250 for, for that's like brand new. Mm -hmm. um, now on doors, um, our prices are lower, you know, on the average than new new doors by usually by about 50 percent, you know. So the only thing that really makes sense is to use the dumps as little as possible. Definitely don't go for garbage burning, and you know, put your money into recycling. And I don't know of any communities that are really doing that. Now we're trying to do it with urban ore, and I think here in Berkeley we're probably doing as well as just about anywhere. The Ecology Center was set up in 1969 and started the nation's first curbside pickup program. For no charge, they pick up 200 tons of separated materials a month. 
cans, newspaper and glass. They work in close cooperation with Community Conservation Centre, which runs the drop-off and buyback centre, also on 2nd and Gilman Street. The public can bring materials here and actually sell them to CCC. Aluminum is an especially valuable commodity weighing in at $600 a tonne or 30 cents a pound. By baling the newspaper, compacting the cans and crushing the glass, CCC can resell these materials to large-scale brokers who in turn sell them to paper mills, canning industries and bottle makers. Thus, the recyclers can afford to pay the public. Resources are conserved. Money flows back into the community. Recycling in Berkeley, while it only deals with less than a quarter of the tonnages disposed of by dumping, makes twice as much money. That makes it eight times more cost effective. Berkeley was named after George Berkeley, the Irish bishop and philosopher, whose quote, westward the course of empire takes its way inspired one of the university's founding members as he gazed out here one day in 1866. The Costanoan Indians lived here in undisturbed harmony with nature for thousands of years before that same course of empire displaced them in 1790. This was the era of the Spanish settlers who were given large areas of land called ranchos. They brought many foreign plants to Berkeley, including marigolds, nasturtiums, lemon and cherry trees. The unique climate here favors the growth of a great variety of plants. It is warm all year round with a short rainy winter season. The soil is rich and fertile, somewhat clay, and it needs the addition of humus-rich material to be in optimum condition. Greenery and abundance of foliage has always been a feature of this neighborhood, making it one of the most naturally beautiful towns in the San Francisco Bay Area. The scent of Berkeley's waste stream by volume is garden waste. Brush, debris, leaves, grass and tree trimmings this has a great potential for recycling, and Urban Ore set up its compost facility in 1982 to intercept such material and to turn it into something rich and fresh smelling, that crumbly substance which is so valuable as an amendment to the soil, compost. Brush and plant debris is brought here by commercial and private haulers who may otherwise have brought it to the dump. Bacteria and fungus work on the material, breaking it down and digesting it in such a way that the final product is a humus-rich substance with an earthy texture and odor, a tonic, conditioner and amendment for the soil. The customers pay a tipping fee, about half of what they would have paid at the transfer station. This is Bob Beatty, site manager. In, t in today's world with high technology and uh, automation, uh, high unemployment, uh, recycling salvage is a uh, real viable uh, form of uh, uh, putting people to work and also uh, giving people uh, the chance to uh, learn good work habits.
because you're dealing in a commodity that uh, is needed. It's like uh, farming. But what we're doing is uh, harvesting the uh, urban uh, humus, the urban forest. We're harvesting that material and processing it and then putting it back into the soil. An average 100 customers a day bring 19 tons of compostable materials here. We have to maintain a certain level of professionalism, and it's, we're learning, we're learning all the time. And we're creating a, uh, trying to create a system, a professional system for uh, dealing with this material so that we can be accepted by the public. The first step is to cull the brush for wood. Large logs are cut into small pieces, which are then stacked and sold as firewood. In all plant matter, there is a high concentration of nitrogen in the green parts and carbon in the wood. Culling reduces the woody carbon content and increases the nitrogen ratio, so that it is about 30 carbon to one nitrogen ideal for composting. Uses a shredder to break up the brush. This will speed the decaying process. to begin decomposing the plant matter. They need a good supply of nitrogen, and so an accelerator is added to the heaps. Some nitrogen-rich substance, such as chicken manure or mushroom compost. Within three months, the piles will have turned into compost, provided they have received enough air and water during that time, with enough heat generated to fully pasteurize the material. It should also be neither too acid or too alkaline. As the brush and plant material decomposes, bacteria continue the work of transformation. They break down the insoluble nitrites into soluble nitrates, actually creating their own cellular structure out of nitrogen. Excess is then given off as ammonia. The temperatures inside the windrows reach 160 degrees Fahrenheit. This is enough to kill off any pathogens, disease-bearing larvae and eggs, and weed seeds. The compost is pasteurizing at this time. They use a front-end loader to aerate the piles. This turns the composting material thoroughly from the inside out. Steam rises in clouds from each turning. The heat is diffused throughout the pile and the bacterial activity spreads. East Bay Municipal Utilities District, also known as EPMUD, is the body which treats the sewage and waste water of the Berkeley and Oakland areas. The solid portion of sewage is called sludge. Ebmud is currently composting about one quarter of all the sludge that they treat. Urban Ore supplies them with mulch, the bulking agent they need for composting such a substance as sludge. Ebmud mixes it with sludge at a rate of about three to one. It prevents the sludge from caking and gives the bacteria a nutritional base. Here they use the forced aeration method 
in which these pipes force air into and throughout the piles, stimulating the bacteria to have their work done within three weeks. Ebmud sells its compost to large-scale brokers for nurseries, lawns, golf courses and gardens. They were prompted to explore composting as an alternative to the rising costs of taking the sludge to a landfill. This is Power Screen, a machine which screens out the bulky wood chips which Urban Ore provided. Developed in Ireland, where it is mainly used in the sand and gravel industry, Power Screen is ideal for removing the bulky parts when the composting process is over. Large wood chips and such must be taken out. So the process then is a sizing process. Uh, we separate the reusable wood chips from the compost product in two piles, and uh, the wood chips are then reused and the compost product is sold. Tom Kernan, one of Power Screen sales reps, describes the screening. So we use a uh, two-inch large mesh on the upper deck, and what falls through that then is again screened on the lower deck. Uh, typically, the desired product is that which comes through the second screening. It grows such sweet things out of such corruptions. It distills such exquisite winds out of such infused fetor. It gives such divine materials to men and accepts such leavings from them at last. This is Myrtle Wolf, an experienced gardener. Not only does, does it do the jobs that the, the other types of compost that I've used done, but, it, but uh, I don't have to add nitrogen. There's enough nitrogen left from the, from the uh, manure in the compost to satisfy all the requirements, even for the moist, uh, shade-loving plants, such as azaleas and rhododendrons. Compost is humus. The same transformation of matter is at work, both in the compost pile and on the forest floor. Nothing is wasted. Nothing ever is in nature. It is the greatest recycling system that there is.
it out. I asked Steve, what would it take for recycling to grow? Thank <laughs> you.